Welcome back and thanks for joining me for another segment. Today I'm going to take more of your questions and do my best to answer them for you. Ronnie Spradlin asked what uh, sets literally shared a wall and what was on the other side of say the living room set. On our sound stage, uh, the living room kitchen set uh, was all sort of attached so you could you could see that and then there was the door to the left just as you entered the living room and on the other side of that wall was indeed the set for the grandparents room and as you went up the first sort of little set of stairs that got to the platform and that other door that also then led to a little platform inside the grandparents bedroom and then you went down steps and so that room was actually there so those two were attached in front of the living room wall as you entered the front door was a porch. So on the soundstage, they did create sort of a porch set there on the soundstage. But in front of that was just the soundstage floor. So there was actually some pretty funny stuff because if we were shooting on the soundstage and you were going to go onto the porch and into the front door, there was maybe not even a full step up. There was maybe like eight inches or something like that. So you had to sort of pretend like you were stepping up onto the porch because on the outside set, of course, there were two or three steps that took us up to that porch. So you couldn't just sort of come parallel to it because your head height would not look right. And same thing if you were exiting the porch, normally on the actual outside step, set you would step down so we would do these funny things where we'd pretend to get taller or shorter so you'd start here and then you go <laughs> as you were walking you'd kind of scrunch down so your head went boom 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 but and if it was like a dramatic scene and you were exiting you felt so stupid to then be doing this little do 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 or coming up like squatting and kind of going boop 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 up into the set so those were kind of funny things that we had to do. Inside the living room, on the other side of the wall where the piano and the radio was, it was a soundstage. So there was nothing outside there. There wasn't another room, but that was supposed to be an exterior wall to the house. Uh, the back side of any of these rooms kind of were, there was nothing there. It was just the back side of like a flat, like um, a piece of, I don't know what they were made out of, some sort of plywood probably. And then they'd have braces on them that would be drilled into the stage floor to hold them steady so the walls didn't fall over. And then if they wanted to move them, they'd just come in and they'd, they'd remove those, whether they were screwed in or whether they had large sandbags on them to hold them and keep them from moving. They would do that because all those walls were removable. Uh, then as you moved into the kitchen, uh, there was attached that sort of back porch area that you occasionally saw inside where there was like, I think there was a workbench. I don't know if there was a, some sort of a laundry tub that we could wash in in there, but it was kind of a bit of a mud room. So that did exist. But then again, on the other side of that was just a soundstage. As you went into the kitchen and you got to the wall where the sink was on the other side of that, nothing, just soundstage. There was the door uh, that was sort of a pantry on the show. We did see it occasionally, but most of the time, if you opened that door, again, you were onto the soundstage, and if you went out there and you walked, I don't know, 10 feet, was another structure where the um, property people could prepare all the food for scenes. So they had sort of a, a bit of a working kitchen there that they could use for preparing food and then they just come through that door and on the rare occasion where you actually saw that it was a cupboard or a pantry they would just bring another set piece in and put it in place so that when that door opened that's what you saw when you went up the stairs there was nothing you kind of went up the stairs and then when we disappeared around the corner there was just a little holding area there you know maybe four by four and then nothing with just like railings there to keep everybody sort of from falling off there <laughs> Uh, and that was kind of it. There was nothing else connected to that. As you moved further up along the soundstage, the bedrooms were sort of attached. So there was another section on the soundstage where uh, there were there was the upper hallway to the bedroom. So you would come up there and immediately to the right, there was a couple little steps that went up theoretically into the attic. Uh, so that was just a set. And then you continued and the next door was 
the door to John Boy's room. So all of these bedrooms, so that um, John Boy's room on two sides, like where his window was, and then just a regular wall, that was just to the soundstage. Uh, but his other wall was connected to the hallway. And then the first to the left was the boy's room. And so some of those walls were just really to the soundstage. And those were typically the walls that were not even put in because that was where the camera was. So you, they tended to shoot mostly the same direction into the boy's room. Same thing uh, with John Boy's room. Most of the time, the same wall was removed that they, that was where the camera was. And then you continued along the hall and then you, at the end of the hall, you got to the room that doubled. Well, there was the bathroom, which was just in place. So it was almost like the core of that was all built together and those walls did adjoin, but then all the exterior all the way around those was all just open to the soundstage. Um, and then there was the room that doubled as the parents' room and the girls' bedroom and they would just change out the furniture in there. The main walls that were taken out or put in were where the window was, and then the farthest wall, which was typically the direction that the camera shot from. So you'd tend to be shooting towards uh, where the beds were and where the dresser was, and you could see the window to the left, so that was often where that was. Uh, so it was just kind of all laid out as a floor plan as if it were on a piece of paper flat, as opposed to actually two stories. And then they dug out a section of the soundstage to go down the stairs. So when you saw people go through that hallway and then go down the stairs as if they were going to down to the living room to the first floor, they dug out. So steps were there and then you turned a corner and it was just dirt. Again, a small little holding area that you could go down to or you could come up from. So that's sort of what was on the other side of those walls. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but how they managed to make it seem like it's all part of one set. And then you asked, where did cast members park their cars? Uh, well, it depended on the season. Um, initially, we could just kind of park wherever we could find. There were certain areas you weren't allowed to park and those would be marked because equipment needed to be parked there. Um, it was, parking was tricky. And there was a point where we were, when we were young, where um, they had our guardian parent or guardian drop us at the soundstage and then go park at a parking lot at, towards the back lot of the studio, and then they'd have to walk back. And then in later seasons, we actually got assigned parking places. So someplace along the um, outside of our soundstage, there'd be your name bracket. And so you actually had a parking place. But then when we moved to the back lot, you just parked along the road where all the equipment was. And, you know, sometimes you didn't even take your car there. You might just walk back there because it was a pretty easy walk. Just took a few minutes. Uh, so that was the deal on the parking. Um, and then... Did y'all pick up your checks on the set or where? Uh, checks were mailed to us. The crew might have had their checks handed out, but ours were mailed to us through our agents. So um, our agents would get them and our agents would then take their percentage for their commission and then they would mail mail the check on to us, mail a new check on to us. And then final, most actors on classic shows take something from the set to keep as a memento. I've talked a little, I've talked about this before, but for those of you who hadn't heard, we didn't take anything. For one thing, we didn't know that it was going to be our last show. So it wasn't even a matter of saying, hey, it's our last show, is there something we can take? So it wasn't an option, we weren't offered anything. I know, I think Mary McDonough ended up with a couple of costume pieces that the wardrobe person told her she could take, uh, but I don't even know if it was the end of the ninth season or if it was a different season. Uh, so. Prop sets, I mean, they all belonged to either the company or the studio. So it wasn't really, the studio potentially could have given us things if it belonged to the studio, but most of that stuff was studio stock or whatever, or company stock, and they didn't didn't give us anything. So no, just the memories, which are probably the most valuable. And this question is, I'm not sure how these go together. So it's like Evie Mansui. Uh, sorry, I probably butchered that. Uh, anyway, you asked, could I talk about the costumes? Who decides the style of the costumes? The costume designer uh, would 
know and have done the research on the era and the style of the period like ours started off in the depression. So our costumer would have done that research about rural Virginia in the 1930s, what were people wearing um, and understanding the depression era that people weren't buying new clothes unless they had money and not many people had money at that point. So it would be well-worn clothes and simple simple clothes that were functional for working. Everybody, these were working people. And they would have that conversation as part of like the production, original production meetings about the look of the show overall. So once all of that was established, then it was pretty much up to the costume designer, um, the head wardrobe person to make those sorts of decisions. Um, and they just, needed to work within the style of the period. Then you said, are the costumes sewn together new or are they purchased? Uh, for period pieces, almost never purchased uh, because they were more specific than what you could go out and purchase. Certain things, and in later years, and people have talked about how they thought the boys' jeans weren't period or some of the girls' jeans later on weren't. And as we got towards the end of the series, because in the late 1970s, early 80s, there was a resurgence of 40s style clothing. So there were things that could be bought off the rack because it, it, they had gone back to that sort of a style. Early on, I think they pulled a lot of stuff from Warner Brothers wardrobe department, uh, which had all sorts of just racks and racks of, of clothes and from different eras and different movies and things that had been filmed on the studio. And then some pieces were made. I know there were some of my dresses that were sewn for me in a, you know, same style and a couple different fabrics or something like that. So there were pieces that were made and then a lot of it was stock clothing. So that's how that worked. And then they would go back into stock after they were done. And a lot of the clothes were older. And so they, they were thin and worn. And so they were, a lot of times they were ripping. And so they either patch them or a lot of times they would take um, gray, like grip tape and duct tape. And, and they would put that on the inside of, so you'd have like, you know, these patches where it just kind of pulled the fabric together. So you couldn't see there was a tear and you didn't see a patch. But when it was hot, that would start some of the, the sort of sticky part sometimes would start oozing out from the tape. And so you'd have the sticky stuff on you. And so and there'd come a point where it's just like, just couldn't patch it anymore. And so that would finally be a costume that went away. Um, that happened more in the very early seasons, but I do remember those. <laughs> how long does it take to put together the costumes for each actor? I think it depends on how complex the, the costumes were. Now, if you're talking theater, again, uh, the costume, designer works with uh, the director and with the about talking about the overall look of a show and same thing a lot of times depending on the show and the period they can either be purchased or they can be built and depending on how complex those costumes are it will depend on how long they take to build. I know when I worked with the theater uh, there are times where I did end up doing costumes. I do. I'm not a great seamstress but I'm I'm competent and with theater, because you had some distance to the audience, things didn't always have to be so perfect that you could see flaws if you were up close. Although I've heard with big budget shows that costumes were beautifully designed and spent a lot of money, but never on the productions I worked on. You know, usually if I was working on costumes, I had maybe a couple weeks to pull all the costumes together. So sometimes we had a bit of a costume stock and so I'd pull things, but then modify things or add pieces they didn't have. So you'd have, you know, about a week or two to kind of pull all those costumes together. And sometimes there were alterations that needed to be done or hems or buttons or whatever. Uh, with television, uh, you know, they sort of pull together the costumes mostly at the beginning of the season, but you'd add pieces along the way and new guests that would come in. They'd have not that long from the time the person was cast to go in and figure out what they were doing, but they did have a, a team of seamstresses that could do either make things or alter things as needed. And then were the costumes repurposed? Absolutely. I've talked sometimes about it, like a coat that the character of Aaron had at one point had also been worn by Marsha Woolery and also worn by Kurt's 
sister when she came to visit. Anyway, the same coat showed up about three times on different characters and sometimes dresses you would see on different characters. So absolutely, and when, then when things would go back into either the company stock or the Warner Brothers stock, you'll see them in other shows and other movies, which is kind of fun. And some of you have spotted things like that. And that's what I have for you for this segment. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to put your questions in the comments. And uh, also, if you're enjoying these and you haven't already, please do hit like and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.